from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I had the great pleasure of working with Peter Baker at the Washington Post for nearly a decade, but we actually never met. Um, his reputation loomed large, of course. He was a great foreign correspondent and a great White House correspondent. Uh, and a White House reporter, but um, I was a Metro reporter covering the Fairfax County school system about a dozen years after Peter covered it, and sure enough, they were still talking about him. <laughs> Every story, I heard all of it, the sources he had, the great things he uncovered. Uh, it was really kind of incredible, considering there were about six reporters between he and I covering this beat. Um, he's really one of the finest journalists of our generation. He and his wife, Susan Glasser, were foreign correspondents for the Post in Russia for nearly four years. And of course, now he's gone on to great things as the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. Peter's written three books. The most recent one, Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House chronicles that administration's eight years and all of its tumult from 9-11 through the financial collapse of 2008. After this, if you'd like to get a book autographed, Peter will be signing at the book signing table at noon today. Please join me in welcoming Peter Baker. Boy, thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. I love covering Fairfax County Schools. That's such a great reminder. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, in fact, one of my uh, colleagues from covering Fairfax many years ago, Mark Grossman's here. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's uh, a very kind introduction. It's, you know, it's a great treat to be at the National Book Festival, an extraordinary institution that's been created here. Uh, I want to especially thank Maria Rana, by the way, who uh, brought me here into this today. She was a terrific editor of the Washington Post Book Review for many years and a stellar author in her own right. But it's a little intimidating to be here, I have to say, at the same event as so many extraordinary authors, you know. I mean, really, let's face it, I'm the warm-up act for Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> Definitely stay, she's awesome. Um, but it's extra special for me to be part of this event, in particular, to talk about this book, because, of course, uh, this, uh, in, this festival got its start with Laura Bush, working together with the fabulous people at the Library of Congress to create uh, a place where people can come and talk about reading and exploring the many ideas and the many, uh, the many stories that there are to tell in our world today. And I, I just want to thank everybody who's involved with it for, for putting it on. It's, it's uh, uh, to be on, uh, on this side of the microphone instead of that side where I'm more, normally am more comfortable is, is, a, is a treat. And um, uh, we'll try to make this as painless as possible today. Um, you know, it's good to be here taking a break from covering uh, the day-to-day -day events at the White House. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit busy these days. I, I was going to wear my tan suit, but I, <laughs> I understand that's uh, that's a controversial thing. I didn't want to get in the middle of, of that kind of thing. But it's a dizzying time in the news today, right? So much is happening. It's really hard to keep up. We've got war in Ukraine and in Gaza and Syria and Iraq. We've got the crisis of the Afghan elections and the. Veterans Affairs Department melting down and the CIA spying on the Senate and, you know, uh, the border crisis in Texas and the terrible tumult in Ferguson and political dysfunction on Capitol Hill. You know, it makes you wonder why it is you ever want to be president in the first place, you know. David Letterman said the other night that uh, President Obama called Hillary Clinton and asked her, can you start early? <laughs> it, it's... Uh, it reminds me, actually, in a lot of ways, of the last days of the Bush administration, which is chronicled in, in this book, Days of Fire. In fact, just a few weeks before leaving office, President Bush was hosting uh, the Kennedy Center honors for various artists and actors, and he, uh, uh, one of the recipients was the actor Morgan Freeman. And President Bush is going through the, you know, Freeman's many credits and remembered that one of the movies uh, he had played in was called Deep Impact, where Morgan Freeman had played a president. And President Bush looked up from the notes that his staff had given him, and he kind of ad lib. He said, you know, that's, that's the one where the comet destroys all civilization, he says. That's about the only thing that hasn't happened in the last eight years. <laughs> and when he sat down, Condoleezza Rice kind of was sitting next to him and leaned over and whispered, don't tempt fate, we still have a couple weeks left. <laughs> so, you know, as much as they disagree on the big issues of the day, I think President Obama and President Bush might be feeling a little more understanding for each other 
these days. You know, what we see from this cascade of crises in recent weeks and months uh, reminds us that the presidency is, you know, in a lot of ways miscast. Uh, there are days you're not really the leader of the free world. You're the leader of the biggest bucket brigade in history. You know, you're, you're trying to put out the latest fire. You may have grand ambitions for changing the world, but the world is a way of not cooperating, and you find yourself struggling just to keep up. That was certainly true for a lot of time for President Bush. Much as he tried to be master of, of his administration, like President Obama, he found himself uh, uh, whipsawed at times by events, some of which he was responsible for, some of which were beyond his control. And that sort of inspired the name of the book, Days of Fire. It comes specifically from his second inaugural address when he referred to 9-11 as a day of fire. And the conceit of the title is, in effect, it was sort of eight years of days of fire, terrorism and war and natural disaster and financial collapse. At times, everything that could go wrong, it felt like did go wrong. And interestingly, we now see with President Obama and President Bush at this stage of their presidency, some similarities. Obviously, very different men, very different presidents in, this, in a lot of ways, different types of decisions that they make, different ideologies, but struggling to command their time in office. President Obama today, in our most recent poll, has about support about 40% of the people, which is slightly better than the 36% who supported President Bush at the same time. In a recent CNN poll, 33% of Americans supported impeaching President Obama which is just slightly more than the 30% who supported impeaching President Bush at the same time in his administration. You heard a lot at the time during Bush's administration from some people who were critical saying, well, he's the worst president ever, and people wrote articles to this effect. And, and now you've got a Quinnipiac poll showing that 33% of Americans consider President Obama to be the worst president ever. Slightly ahead of the 28% who still named President Bush. And you know, at a certain point, it makes you wonder, what does it take? What, what, you know, is it even possible anymore to be a successful president in this day and age? You know, no doubt that past presidents confronted bigger, more existential crises than we see today. I mean, Abraham Lincoln had the Civil War, and FDR had the Depression, and World War II. As President Obama put it just yesterday, the world has always been messy. But today's presidents face challenges that their great predecessors never really encountered, challenges that they have yet to fully master. Imagine fighting the Nazis in the era of Twitter or Facebook, you know? We haven't even landed the troops at uh, Normandy, but all right, people are second guessing. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. Everything moves so much faster than ever before. You know, when the first nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Harry Truman wasn't informed for 16 hours. He had ordered it, but he didn't know for 16 hours that it had actually been carried out. Imagine that. Today, a president gives a speech or engages in a campaign debate, and the criticism and the critiques and the reviews start before he's even finished speaking. We're also obviously governing in very polarized times, right? President Bush presided over polarized times. President Obama does as well. I think both men and President Clinton, who I also cover, came to office with this great hope of being unifiers, not dividers. That was President Bush's phrase. President Clinton's phrase was uh, to be a repairer of the breach, uh, taken from Isaiah. And what we found with his presidency and the two that have succeeded is the breach is very, very large today. Polarization isn't new, of course but it's been exacerbated by various forces that are pulling us further and further apart. Our congressional districts have been redrawn to be so homogenous that many members of the House worry much more about being taken out in a primary than they do in a general election, which has a way of pulling a Democrat further to the left and a Republican further to the right. No incentive anymore for compromise. And it's not just our politicians, too. We like to blame them, understandably, but we ought to look in the mirror every once in a while, too. Look at ourselves, look at our own uh, habits. We now live in communities more and more with people who agree with the way we think. Statisticians, statisticians have actually charted this. It's very interesting. In 2012, 98% of the counties with the densest population voted for President Obama. And 98% of the 50 counties with the least densest populations voted for Governor Romney. Overall, if you live in a community with a population density over 800 people per square mile, you're twice as likely to be a Democrat. If you live in a community with a density under 800 people per square mile, you're twice as likely to be a Republican. And not only do we live in f different physical worlds, we often live in different intellectual and informational worlds today. If you're conservative, you're more likely to watch Fox and think Benghazi is the biggest issue in the world. If you're liberal, you're more likely to watch MSNBC and think Governor Christie's bridge closing is the biggest issue in the world. 
And so, so many of these issues that a president is dealing with is against the context and backdrop of a society and a, and a nation that are already tearing apart at the seams. And I watch President Obama day in, day out deal with a lot of these issues, Iraq and NSA surveillance, Russia, Iran, terrorism, immigration, and it all feels familiar. I, we've heard these issues before. And that's why it's important, I think, to understand what happened in the last administration. To understand President Obama, you have to understand President Bush. And that's why I spent six years working on this book. I learned that covering a White House, we probably get at the time maybe 10, 15, 20 percent of what's really going on. And only afterwards do we have the opportunity to go back and peel the curtain and try to get a bigger, better, deeper, richer understanding of a presidency. One that dispels the mythology and, and tries to, to confront the reality, good and bad, uh, as it might be. Uh, the Bush Cheney administration is a great case study in this because if we were to follow the common understanding, we would think we've got these two men, one who was the easily manipulated front man and the other the secret puppet master pulling the strings, telling what to do behind the scenes. And let's face it, that made for a lot of great night, late night comedy and so forth. Eventually, Pre Vice President Cheney actually kind of came to embrace his dark image. At one point, his staff actually bought him a Darth Vader mask, <laughs> brought it to him, and he put it on. <laughs> And somebody took a photograph. And I am still hunting for that photograph today. It's somewhere in the National Archives, but they have not released it. Vice President Cheney actually wanted to put it in his book when he published his book. And Lynn Cheney understandably talked him out of it. <laughs> but what I had discovered in six years of research and, and 400 interviews and, and, and thousands of pages of documents and so on was that the common caricature missed, I think, the fundamental and ultimately more interesting story of their partnership, of their tandem. The evolution from this collaboration that they really had at the beginning to a virtually complete break by the time that they left office. There's no question that Dick Cheney was the most influential vice president we've ever seen. Now that may not be saying that much, it's kind of a sorry story to begin with, right? I mean, John Adams called the vice presidency the most insignificant offer, office that ever the invention of man contrived. <laughs> Thomas Marshall, who was Woodrow Wilson's vice president, used to tell the joke about two brothers. One went off to sea, one became vice president, neither was heard from since. <laughs> John, John Nance Garner, who was FDR's first pre vice president, famously called the office not worth a bucket of warm spit or maybe something more or less C-SPAN worthy. LBJ said, I detested every minute of it being vice president. Gerald Ford said it was the worst eight months of his life. It wasn't until Walter Mondale that we even let the vice president into the White House. He was the first one to have an office in the West Wing, hard to believe. Now, Vice President Cheney actually knew all this. He told me during one of our interviews for the book that the vice presidency was a crappy job. That was his phrase, a crappy job. And he should know because he helped make it a crappy job for at least two other vice presidents, <laughs> right? He was chief of staff to President Ford, and he made it his mission to block Nelson Rockefeller's more liberal initiatives and ultimately help push him off the ticket in 1976. He was defense secretary for President Bush, 41, and when Dan Quayle tried to run a crisis during, in the Philippines since the president was absent, Cheney made clear he had no place in the chain of command. That was not the vice president's role. But when it came time to become vice president himself and to run with Governor Bush on the ticket in 2000, Dick Cheney uh, or, uh, uh, arranged for what he called a different understanding. He would be a different kind of vice president. He assembled a power base through a mastery of Washington that's really unparalleled. He understood how Washington worked, and he built a relationship of trust with President Bush that very few vice presidents have had with their presidents. President Bush gave him access to every meeting and every decision, unlike so many of his predecessors. Harry Truman, his vice president, had only met with FDR twice by the time FDR died. And somebody asked Vice President Cheney once in 20, 2002, well, how many times have you met with President Bush privately? And he responded by pulling out his Schedule a card, and he said, well, let me see, three, four, five, six, seven times, he said, and then he paused for effect today. <laughs> and President Bush was glad to have him by his side. This relationship was born of the fact that he understood the limitations of having been governor of Texas, that he didn't have a seasoning in Washington or foreign affairs, and he thought that Cheney would provide that for him. And he had in Cheney a loyal number two who wasn't going to run for his office. Think about that, right? Every vice president, going back really to Charles Dawes, wanted to be president. 
So the relationship between a president and a vice president is, fund is fundamentally fraught from the beginning, right? I think of Clinton and Gore, these two men who, you know, these two Southerners who in 1992 seem so much alike, but if really, it's kind of like, it's kind of like California, right? It's nice and sunny on the surface and beneath it, there are these tectonic plates grinding against each other, right? Because you've got one man who's president, eventually a woman who's president, and another one who thinks he ought to be, right? And is plotting for four or eight years about how he's gonna run. And therefore, the, the, the built-in tension between these two figures is almost automatically uh, a recipe for friction and competition. That wasn't the case with President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Cheney had disavowed any interest in running for president. He was serious about it. Bush took him at his word, and because of that, Cheney could be entirely uh, loyal to his president, and Bush took him that way. He relied on him so much that Cheney was the one guy he really, really wanted to see when the, I can't use this word, when the, uh, the uh, you know what hit the fan. <laughs> My little boy Theo is here. I just want to say hello, Theo. <laughs> um, by the way, Theo's advice to a book author, any other authors here, his advice was perfect. He's, I said, Theo, what should I do? He's nine years old now. He was, I think, seven when it, I was finishing the book. And he gave me good advice. He said, Dad, just make it compelling. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. So the, the key moment that tells you a lot about the early part of Bush and Cheney's uh, relationship comes in March 2003. President Bush has decided to go to war in Iraq, as we all know, a very faithful and, and, and ill-fated decision. And uh, George Tenet, the CIA director, Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, come to the White House with intelligence. They say they think they know where Saddam Hussein is. They could early hit a, uh, launch an early strike, take him out, maybe end the war from the beginning, should they go ahead and do it. And President Bush gathers all his advisors, and they talk it through. They discuss all the different factors. And then when the moment is coming where he has to make a decision, you either have to launch or not launch because the planes have to get in and out, he kicks everybody out of the room, except for Dick Cheney. The one person he wants to talk to, the one person whose advice he values the most in this moment of great decision is Cheney. And the two of them talk privately and they come out and that's when Bush says go. And it's the beginning of the Iraq war, for better or worse, for many years to come. But as you explore, the, that, that gives a, the, the misimpression, I think, of the relationship. Aha, that means Cheney's really the guy. He's the one making decisions. I think that misses the, the, the more interesting evolution of their partnership over time. As things began to go badly in Iraq, as President Bush got his feet grounded more in the office, he began to turn away from Vice President Cheney in a pretty dramatic way. I think he was frustrated that they didn't find the weapons that he had been told were there. He was unhappy that the war was going south, that it wasn't a mission accomplished, that he had thought it was. And he was eager to repair the relations with allies that had been broken in the first term. And so as he comes to think about his second term and he begins to frame it in a way that will create a legacy that he wants, he takes a turn and he elevates Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, and she becomes his most fundamental, most important advisor, even as a counterweight to some, to really, to a large extent, to Vice President Cheney. And that's not to say that uh, Vice President Cheney was entirely on the margins in the second term, but he was on defense more than offense, trying to fend off what he thought were changes in policies that would weaken the country in his view, that would take them off the course that he and President Bush had originally set. They began uh, working more with the Allies on Iran, on North Korea, they began uh, pulling back some of the more controversial policies on interrogation, on detention. They began working with uh, uh, Congress on issues like surveillance after they've been revealed by, by the, the news media. Uh, the president uh, was less and less interested in using force in other circumstances. And Vice President Cheney found himself increasingly on the outs. Uh, by the time they left office, in fact, President Bush and Vice President Cheney were on opposite sides of North Korea, gun rights, same-sex marriage, tax cuts, Guantanamo, interrogation policy, surveillance policies, Iran, the auto bailout, climate change, the Lebanon war, Harriet Myers, Don Rumsfeld, Middle East peace, Syria, Russia, federal spending. It was a pretty long list. A particularly telling moment in how their relationship changes over time comes in 2007. Much like the beginning of the Iraq War, 
somebody arrives at the White House with intelligence. In this case, it's the Israelis, and they've told the president that Syria now has a nuclear facility secretly built with the help of the North Koreans in the desert, and they want them to bomb it. They think it's a threat, and they ask for help. So President Bush does the same thing he did in 2003. He gathers his team together. He asks their advice. They talk it over. But this time, instead of kicking them all out to ask Vice President Cheney his advice alone, he calls on Cheney in front of everybody else. He says, what do you think? And Vice President Cheney argues that they should bomb the facility. The president had set red lines on proliferation, and if they didn't follow through, he, th he said, they would uh, lose their credibility and, uh, and it would leave a threat un uh, unaddressed. And president Bush looked around and he says, okay, does anyone here agree with the vice president? And no hands go up. What a contrast to those early days of the administration in which not only is Cheney marginalized within the team, but the president has just confronted him, forced him to confront it in front of everybody else in a way he never would have done at the beginning. All of this comes to a head in the frantic final days of the administration. Now, as if they didn't have enough going on with the economy kind of collapsing and uh, uh, worrying about coming into another depression, President Bush and Vice President Cheney found their last stretch in office really dominated by a quiet but fierce fight over what to do about Scooter Libby. Now, Scooter Libby, of course, had been the vice president's chief of staff and now security advisor, his right-hand man, so important to him that people called him Cheney's Cheney. He, um, he'd been convicted of perjury and obstruction of justice in the CIA leak case, not for the leak itself, nobody was ever actually charged with that, but for not telling the truth in the interviews with the government. And Vice President Cheney considered that to be bogus. He considered it to be a travesty of justice, a politically fraught investigation that really, in his view, was actually aimed at him, and Scooter Libby had taken the bullet, and he thought President Bush should do something about it. Now, President Bush, though, was skeptical, didn't much like pardons to begin with, thought the whole process was kind of tainted, people with special access were able to get special favors, and here was the ultimate guy with the ultimate special access asking for, in effect, a special favor. He sent out the White House lawyers to go relook at the case. They went through the transcripts. They went and met with Scooter Libby. They talked it through, and they came back and said, well, we think the jury had every reason to find what it found. And that was it for President Bush. Okay, no pardon. But then he had to confront and tell his partner of eight years this decision. And he had lunch with Vice President Cheney. He told him, no pardon. And Cheney snapped at him in a way he had never done in eight years of deference. He said, you're leaving a good man wounded on the field of battle. And that really stung President Bush. It got it, the kind of uh, his own self-image as a person who was loyal to his staff and who uh, didn't follow political uh, wins necessarily. And he was uh, so bothered by this that it kept eating away at him. Very differently, right? His, his whole reputation, and, and mostly correct, is as the decider. He's a very, he is a decisive guy, for better or for worse. He doesn't revisit decisions, doesn't spend a lot of time second-guessing them once he makes them. But in this case, he was so bothered it kept chewing it over. The last weekend in office, he went up to Camp David with his family and a few friends, including Condoleezza Rice and a few others. And it was to be sort of a, kind of a celebration, if you will, of the end of the presidency. They'd gotten through it. The comet hadn't hit the planet. But he was stewing over this so much, Condoleezza Rice finally took him aside and said, you know, you can't make this a pall over your final days in office. Laura Bush actually came to him and says, just make up your mind. You're ruining this for everyone. He decided to stick with the decision, no pardon. Two days later comes Inauguration Day, 2009. The president, by custom, hosts the incoming president at the White House for coffee. And then President Bush and President-elect Obama get in the limousine for the short drive to the Capitol. And it's just the two of them now in the Secret Service in the car. And the last piece of advice President Bush gives to his successor is, whatever you do, he says, set a pardon policy early and stick to it. Even then, at the final moments of such a tumultuous and eventful, at times cataclysmic, and at times, you know, extraordinary administration, the thing that's on his mind is his fight, is his break with his vice president, the one to whom he had once been so close. Well, we know what happened afterwards, of course. Uh, they went their separate ways. Uh, the two of them uh, don't really talk very much anymore. Uh, in April of 2013, President Bush opened his uh, library 
down in uh, Dallas. I went down for that. Vice President Cheney was there. He was in good form, by the way. He had a new heart. made a huge difference for him. You can make all the heart jokes you want, but it was, uh, it was a physically uh, a transformative moment for him. But when they came time for the ceremony, Condoleezza St Rice was on stage and gave a speech, and Vice President Cheney was in the audience with the cabinet and the children. And if you went into the library afterwards and you looked around, you saw videos featuring Andy Card and Josh Bolton and, yes, Condi Rice, and you saw a portrait of Laura Bush and paintings of, uh, pictures of the children, Jenna and Barbara. You saw there was a statue of the dogs. <laughs> but there was no Dick Cheney. Nowhere to be found in that, uh, in that, uh, in that library. So, you know, uh, people often say, well, what about, you know, what we learned about this administration when it's all over? What we learned about Barack Obama and Joe Biden? Did they have the same kind of relationship? No, but I think it's kind of interesting. There are some parallels. Biden was the older, more seasoned Washington hand. President Obama was the more inexperienced guy who was leaning on number two at first. He, uh, 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 over time, I think, le leaned less, has leaned less on, Ch on Vice President Biden. And now we are here in the sixth year of a presidency, and we discover that once again, it's not easy. I, people ask me, you know, will you write a book about President Obama? And I keep imagining a title that says, more days, more fires. <laughs> That's not to say you can't rebound. A president can do a lot in two years, and there's still a lot to go. But these are slogging days uh, for a president. And it doesn't look like he's having that much fun. And I think about President Bush when he left office. You know, he told a, a, a dinner party in Dallas after he left office, uh, that uh, President Obama's inauguration was like a, a day of liberation for him. He said, when I saw his hand go up, I thought, free at last. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to wonder whether President Obama on January 20th, 2017 might feel the same way. <laughs> I think we'll leave it at that. We'll take some questions and maybe have a good conversation. <laughs> We, we got a microphone here and a microphone here. Why don't we start over here? Um, after the fact, have you been able to discover any information about Laura Bush and mm. what she thought of Dick Cheney? That's a great question. Everybody can hear, right? Everybody hear the question, right? The question about uh, Mrs. Bush and her view of Dick Cheney. Well, she you knows she did not obviously play a, 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 a direct role in a lot of the policies and the day to day decisions in this White House. Uh, but there were, you're, there were moments of, uh, of real revelation. There's, there's a great scene uh, in the second term when you might, all remember the vice president's uh, unfortunate hunting accident, yes? <laughs> Again, insert your own joke here. Um, and Mrs. Bush was actually traveling in uh, Europe at the time, and she heard about it from her Secret Service contingent, which had heard, of course, through the Secret Service ne network because they're all very tight with each other. And the story had not yet been put out to the, to the press. And she got mad that Vice President Cheney hadn't announced this and disclosed this and come out and said something about this. And she had her person call back to the White House and tell them, why isn't he getting out there and putting this on? And she, she got uh, very agitated that, uh, uh, that this was sort of uh, taking so long because she understood it was going to hurt uh, the president the longer that uh, it took to disclose this information, get out there and uh, apologize for what had happened. So I thought that was a small window into her frustrations as, th as time went on uh, in, this in, this, uh, in the administration. Yeah. Uh, during uh, Vice President Cheney's time in the House, he was known as, a, as a, an easygoing, humorous guy. Uh, he told a story, if I remember correctly, during his first reelect in Wyoming. He went back to a county fair. He was talking to a, a constituent. He said, I hope, I hope you vote for me. And the constituent said, I will. You've got to be better than the guy who's in there now. Right. And, uh, uh, and he was known for that kind of bonhomie. W what happened to him? How, yeah. did he, how did he go from that to Darth Vader? That's a great question. So the question is, how did, how did Cheney become Darth Vader in effect? And, you know, it's, uh, it's like those first Star Wars movies, right? You know? No, you know, the truth is, I think that um, there are people around Cheney who think he changed, right? Brent Scowcroft famously said he didn't recognize him anymore. Scowcroft had been with him in the Ford administration and the first Bush administration. I think there are two things. I think that as a matter of politics and ideology, I think Cheney was always much more conservative than his low-key, uh, relaxed demeanor might have 
gave the impression, right? He was very good on Sunday TV. He was very good at explaining things. He wasn't bombastic. He had the exact same voting record, according to the American Conservative Union, as Newt Gingrich, but he seemed like such a non-Gingrich kind of figure, right? Because he wasn't out there all, you know, uh, revolutionary in, in the way he presented himself. But he was, he was conservative even back to the four days. He was trying to get Ford to meet with Solzhenitsyn. He was blocking out Nelson Rockefeller. He didn't think much of detente. You know, in, in, the, in the first Bush White House, he thought that Mikhail Gorbachev was a passing fancy, wasn't going to be the real thing. When he was in Congress, he voted for all these things and against these things that make him a pretty conservative dude. And in fact, uh, you know, at one point, the, my old paper, the Washington Post, referred to him as a moderate, and he asked his press secretary to call for a correction. <laughs> so, you know, I think he was always conservative, but I think his demeanor was, you know, came across in a different way. So, you know, Colin Powell's theory of the case is that in previous administrations, Cheney was still conservative, but it was surrounded by more moderate figures, including the two presidents he worked for, President Ford, President Bush, 41, people like James Baker, people like Powell himself, people like Grant Scowcroft, and that therefore he didn't have the same sort of influence that he did later when it came to President Bush, 43, where he had a president who was more like-minded, more conservative, surrounded with more allies like Don Rumsfeld, and therefore able to shape policies in a different way. Now, there are also people who think that he changed in part because of 9-11, you know, that that seared him in a very meaningful way. Um, but also to understand that, I think you have to understand that he was always interested in these, interest, in these issues going back to the 80s. He participated in these continuity of government exercises where they would spirit away a handful of people every year and pretend that the world had been blown up and figure out how to reconstitute government. He played the White House Chief of Staff in these scenarios. So in his mind, he had been thinking about the apocalypse basically for years and years and years. So the day the towers came down, it felt like the manifestation of things he'd been worried about for, for a long, long time. And in his mind, what he was worried about was something worse than 19 guys with box cutters. He had it in his mind that what we were talking about were guys with chemical weapons, biological weapons, God forbid, nuclear weapons. And that, in fact, the country was in far greater peril than we even thought on 9-11. And in that context, that shaped his response, right? If that is the case, to him, that means a lot of things need to be done, even things that are controversial, even things that the public won't like, even things, you know, he won't call it torture, but things that everybody else would, or a lot of other people would call it torture. You know, if, if, if we have to protect the country against that sort of threat, a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, are worth doing. And he, uh, and he remained fixated on that the entire time he was in office. When everybody else began to move on and start thinking about other priorities, that stayed his, his, uh, his fundamental point. And so I think, I think that was sort of the evolution over time. And I think that uh, in some ways it's an evolution, in some ways it wasn't. So it's a long winded answer. So among the, uh, the long list of uh, issues that they in increasingly differed on, uh, you mentioned same-sex marriage. And I wonder if you could describe the difference then and where they, the two of them now stand on that issue. Yeah, that's a great question. So the issues about same-sex marriage, how they were different. Uh, Pre Vice President Cheney had actually always been on the more libertarian side of that issue. He said f his, his line was, freedom means freedom for everybody. Obviously, he was influenced uh, importantly by his daughter, Mary Cheney, uh, who today, of course, is in a, is in a, uh, a, a, a f committed partnership uh, um, and has children, has a family. Um, and that's something President Bush, you know, didn't support. In fact, 2004 comes along, we're having, running for re-election, and he comes out in favor of constitutional amendment barring same-sex marriage, defining marriage as the union of man and woman. And Cheney's upset about that. He didn't like it at all. He blames Karl Rove, by the way. He thinks that's Rove's fault. Um, and he's, very, he's pretty open about it. When he's asked about it at a town hall uh, in August of 2004, he says, I still have my position. I don't get to make the decisions all the time. Um, today, I think, you know, President Bush uh, has not publicly changed his mind about that. But my guess is that, uh, uh, you know, if, if he were in office today, he might take a different position. I, the truth is, I don't think, you know, that was not his driving issue. He was conservative, he is conservative, but uh, his, his wife specifically told him not to take that position in 2004. She reminded him, we've got a lot of gay friends, she said. He, in fact, had publicly, or he, in fact, privately talked to people about how he didn't want the Republican Party to be the party of gay bashing. He didn't like that. And even when he came out and made his announcement on the constitutional amendment, he looked uncomfortable and he, and he urged people not to, to bash people as they debated the issue. I think he was fundamentally uncomfortable with that, uh, with that issue. And his daughters today, of course, have been publicly supportive of, 
uh, same-sex marriage in New York and elsewhere. So, you know, he hasn't changed his position, but my guess is if he governed in different times, uh, he might have approached it in a different way. Yeah. Um, why do you think that George Bush wanted to be president? Oh, good question. Why did George Bush want to be president? Uh, okay, well, <laughs> you want me to say his daddy, right? <laughs> Look, you know, there's obviously something to that, right? He goes through life, his biography follows his father's, uh, and he always seems to be trying to catch up to a father who had been so successful at so many things. He goes to Andover, he goes to Yale. You know, his dad is a famous baseball star at Yale. Bush doesn't make the team, he becomes a cheerleader. Um, Bush, goes, the Bush, the father, obviously goes to war. He's a war hero. Bush, the younger, joins Texas Air National Guard. Uh, you know, is, did he have something to prove? I think he did, of course he did. Any son wants the approval of his father and there's always, there's often a competition there and I think there certainly was in this case and he became president uh, with his father's lessons in mind. He very specifically said on a number of occasions on different issues, I want to do this di differently than my father did in effect. Whether it be obviously Iraq, whether it be Supreme Court justices, he didn't want another suitor, that was what he said. He wasn't going to make the same mistake on taxes that he felt his father had made with uh, breaking his read my lips vow. Uh, he wasn't going to let anybody get to the right of him uh, as his father, he felt, had in, in 1992. So there's no question that his father's experience shaped and influenced his. Now, was it as simple as that? No, of course not. Life is complicated, people are complicated, there are lots of things going on. I think he did uh, enjoy governing, I think he enjoyed uh, public office, I think he enjoyed, he, he often talked about how he liked making decisions. It was sort of a, you know, uh, that, was, that was what kind of drove him. Uh, if President Clinton loves diving into an issue and really kind of chewing over all the different aspects and the intellectual arguments this way or that way, President Bush enjoys, you know, uh, a clean, you know, set of options and making a decision and then moving on in this sort of in MBA way as he saw it. So I think, I think it's a mix of these things, but you can't, you can't discount the, the, the influence of your family. Sir. Yes, you mentioned uh, that the Scooter Libby issue was a big issue for the break, but I wonder how significant the hospital bed issue with Comey coming there for Ashcroft, because that seemed to be not a loyalty issue, that seemed to be really a reading of the law and constitution and, and Cheney's looseness in, in dealing with that and Bush's willingness to follow the law as he was being advised. Yeah, that's a good question. So people often ask, right, what was the break? Was there a single moment that kind of drove Bush and Cheney apart? And in the research I did, I didn't find such an easy, you know, single moment. But I think it's a lot of moments like that one that begin to you know, nudge them apart. And that, in that case, President Bush hadn't been told about this whole fight, about whether to reauthorize the secret NSA program until really the last minute. And he felt very upset that he felt that he was being sandbagged uh, with a decision at the last minute. Vice President Cheney was trying to convince uh, the Justice Department, which was reluctant to, over, to, uh, to reauthorize it. Uh, and, and I think that's one of a number of events where President Bush felt like uh, uh, he wasn't being well served. Uh, James Comey comes to him and says, or he, he brings James Comey in and says, why are you about to resign over this? I can't believe you're bringing this to me at the last minute. Comey is stunned that President Bush hadn't known about it until then. I think that was part of a series of events that began to kind of tug them apart. Yeah. Uh, President Bush uh, rather infamously claimed to have a, an understanding of Vladimir Putin. I don't think uh, President Obama would make that claim. Uh, do you think that, that Bush was deceived or Putin has changed? And, uh, and as someone who's in a, who has been to uh, Russia and written about Putin, where do you think uh, that's all going? Yeah, that's a great question, and we could spend an hour just on that alone. But I, I do think that, uh, I think President Bush wanted to believe that Putin could be his partner. I think President Putin, was very clever in their first meeting to understand that Bush was a religious person, so President Putin played up his own history of, of, uh, of religion. He told him a story about a cross his mother had given him, which was the only thing that survived when his dacha caught on fire, and I think that, you know, that really, uh, you know, struck Bush. And look, you know, Putin was a, was a trained KGB guy. He understood how to work other people and to, and to, and to appeal to what they really, uh, uh, wanted to hear, right? I think President Bush uh, uh, understood eventually, pretty clear actually, 
by 2003 that Putin was not who he had thought he was. Uh, and he became increasingly frustrated by him, but he tried to keep it private. They had these fights, re repeated fights over things like democracy and, and rule of law. And uh, uh, you know, the book has some really interesting scenes in there where Bush is just sort of eventing his frustration with other world leaders about Putin. He says it's like talking with an eighth grader who, who has his facts wrong. He just, you know, I can't, I can't get through to this guy. And he's, but he refuses to give up, right? This is where he makes a decision. He decides that he's going to keep trying to, to pull Putin into the world, in effect, to make him a partner, no matter how much Putin doesn't seem likely to do that. Uh, so President Obama comes in office, and having watched President Bush's experiences, well, that guy is not going to be somebody I'm going to work with. And instead, he invests in Dmitry Medvedev, who becomes briefly, four years, president while Putin sits in the prime ministership. And, the, and Obama's hope is that they can build up Medvedev as an alternative to Putin. That's a mistake. Obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, Putin came back into office, and, and we're, we're now we see Putin uh, even more uh, uh, ascendant than he's ever been. So where's it going to go? I don't know. That's an awfully tough question. And I, I, uh, yeah, I can probably say no, we're good and get away with that. But I think um, uh, we'll be covering that a lot in the days to come. So, yeah. Yeah. How much cooperation did you get from the principals, uh, the Bushes, the Cheneys, Condoleezza Rice, and so forth? And what were the usual ground rules? Yeah, that's a great question. How much cooperation from the principals? Well, um, I interviewed about 275 people who were involved in some way or another. They were cabinet officials or uh, members of the White House staff or relatives and some congressmen and uh, uh, generals and so forth. Uh, President Bush did not talk for the book. Uh, he thought that, uh, that uh, a couple of things. He thought a New York Times reporter can't be fair to him. Uh, I'd like to think otherwise, but that's what he thinks. And he thought that he had said what he wanted to say in his book and didn't think he had any need to, to keep revisiting it. Vice President Cheney, on the hand, did participate, gave several interviews, very open, uh, very matter of fact, um, not defensive at all. I thought it was very constructive and good interviews. Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, Colin Powell, David Petraeus, Steve Hadley, Mike Gerson, Josh Bolton, all these po people talked uh, for the book. And the thing that was really gratifying, as I have to say, by the way, was that um, most of them talked at first on background, you know what that means, where we basically, you don't even watch it, of course you know what that means, what it means is we don't use our names uh, with the information. And in 95% of the cases, I would say, I went back and said, can we put this on the record? And, and they, they said yes. And so, fortunately, you know, this is a book that's rely, that relies very predominantly on on the record information, the footnotes are full. Of, uh, of citations, and, and hopefully that's going to be uh, useful for readers who can then make their own judgments about how, uh, how to evaluate the information in their form. Thank you for the good question. Uh, I get, we, one more question? No. I, I, we're, we're, uh, I think we have to wrap it up with that. That sounds like it. Can I have one more question here? I'm sorry. She's sitting here. I don't want to labor. Standing. We'll make it fast. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, you, you indicated that you worked in the media for the last 10 years. And um, you also indicated that Obama, President Obama, is uh, the worst president at 33%. No, I said 33% I said say he is. I didn't say that. OK. OK, just okay. be clear all on right, that. All right, all right, all right. The polls show. <laughs> but that's indicated in the media. Despite that, I would disagree, and I want your opinion on that, because public opinion states otherwise. He has worked with a Congress for the last six years that has been very obstructive. And as a person in the media, I would like you to explain, I guess, how did you all come up with that? And why did you not indicate otherwise? Because again, public opinion indicates otherwise. Okay, well, just to be clear, I, when I was saying that, I said that. A poll showed that 33% of Americans call him the worst president ever, much like about 28% uh, now call President Bush the worst ever. My point was that we are in a polarized time. My point is that we, uh, we, uh, we don't give our presidents much of, a, uh, of, a, of slack anymore, whether they're Democrat or Republican, whether they're you know, Bush or whether they're Obama. Uh, it's a very tough time to govern because a certain built-in part of the population is not going to support you no matter what you do. Uh, and the institutions of our media and politics are now constructed in a way to pull apart 
uh, the society rather than to bring it together. And so I, I meant that as a way of showing how for both President Obama and President Bush, a very, very difficult context in which to govern, in which to try to bring a country together uh, when there are so many people who are willing to, uh, who are very critical of you and who are uh, 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 pulling in the other direction. So that's what I meant to say. I hope, that, uh, I, hope I can clarify that a little bit. And I think at this point we need to wrap up because obviously everybody's here for uh, a really good set coming up. And I <laughs> want to thank you all for taking the time. It's really great to be here. Great questions. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.